Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. As you can probably tell from the uh, clickbait title and thumbnail, you're going to be seeing some big numbers in today's battle. Today's hero is Frostbite WTF in the brand new, all singing, all dancing Italian Tier 10 battlecruiser. The R Help me out here Italians, I'm not sure how you pronounce this. Ruggiero de Luria? I'm sure that's close enough. This ship was originally only available, I think, August last year as part of the Steel Will event. Although a couple of months ago, it got put in sale in the armory for 31,000 steel. It's a tier 10 Italian battle cruiser armed with eight 457 millimeter or 18 inch guns. And as an Italian battle cruiser, its ammunition choices are semi-armor piercing or armor piercing, no high explosive. Usually on Italian battleships, when you get this kind of ammunition choice, the semi-armor piercing is almost always the way to go because the armor piercing is pretty bad. But the armor piercing on this ship is, well, basically exactly the same as the armor piercing ammunition fired by the British battlecruiser, the St. Vincent, so it's not terrible. You are still, however, probably gonna be wanting to using the semi-armor piercing most of the time because it is so incredibly good. What is not good, as you just saw Frostbite triggering his spotting plane there, is the main battery firing range. Even with the spotting plane up, adding 20% to your gun range, it's not great. With a base maximum firing range of just slightly more than 19 kilometers. It is, however, with both the semi and the regular armor piercing, capable of overmatching 32, sorry, 30, not 32, it's not a Yamato, 30 millimeters of armor plating, which makes this thing particularly dangerous to cruisers. Note that's overmatching 30 millimeters of plating, not penetrating. They'll penetrate a lot more than that. The semi-armor piercing will actually penetrate 114 millimeters and the armor piercing a lot more than that. But it will overmatch, in other words, they won't roll to see whether or not there's any ricochet check. They will basically cut through up to 30 millimeters of plating as if it wasn't even there. Which means these guns are entirely capable of citadelling from the front just about every cruiser and almost all of the battle cruisers and some of the particularly badly armored battleships in the game as well. And they're accurate. It gets cruiser dispersion, which is nice. The damage per minute is on the low side though. I mean, it gets a standard 30 second reload. You know, we're not talking of a Montier with a 40 second reload, but it does only have the eight gun barrels. They are kind of accurate though. And the semi-armor piercing really packs a punch. As I discovered here when I thought, oh look, it's the St. Vincent, it's a battle cruiser. You really should have armor piercing loaded. And he unloads the semi-armor piercing. And yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of damage. The semi-armor piercing is generally only going to do that kind of damage to battleships and battle cruisers if you hit the superstructure or the deck, because it will penetrate up to 114 millimeters. If you hit the belt armor of any battleships or battle cruisers, and even a lot of the cruisers that you're likely to find up here in a tier 10 battle, you're going to get a lot of shatters. Oh, before we go into further detail, let's just have a quick word about the matchmaking, because as usual, the matchmaking has done its uh, typical lopsided job of balancing the teams. It's given the enemy team two aircraft carriers, because apparently the matchmaker doesn't understand what a flight deck is. The enemy team have a Lexington, which is just tier 8. Frostbite's team have a Yorktown, also tier 8, but the enemy team have a tier 10, sorry, tier 9, Kearsarge. A hybrid battleship that's also an aircraft carrier. On the bright side, the enemy team do not have any radar. Then again, Frostbite's team don't have any radar either, at least not anymore, because the first ship sunk almost immediately after the battle started was the friendly Salem, so neither teams have radar, the enemy team have twice the number of aircraft carriers. And that potentially could be a massive problem for Frostbite, because even by the laughable standards of what passes for anti-aircraft defences in this game, this ship's is particularly bad. Even the tier 8 Lexington on the enemy team is going to have no problems whatsoever penetrating this tier 10 battlecruiser's anti-aircraft defences. 
Another thing that's fairly bad about this ship are its secondaries, and for a number of reasons. First, it only gets 16 secondary gun barrels. They're 135mm, which means that they can actually penetrate up to 38mm of armour, which is fairly impressive, if they hit. And therein lies the problem. If they hit. Because it only has 8 of them per side, they only have a 7km range, and they have a 10.7 second reload. Oof, Grosser Kerfus just went down in spectacular fashion. That's the enemy team ahead by one kill. Although nobody actually controls a cap circle yet. I mean, Frostpoint's team did have the cap circle at Charlie, but that's being flipped by a Montana, of all things. And the team do have a destroyer, the Adriatico, attempting to flip the cap at Charlie, but he's just run face first into a Smolensk. So I think we're about to see the fourth casualty of this battle, and it ain't going to be on the enemy team. Although, I don't know, I mean, he's doing a lot of damage with these semi-armor piercing shells to, well, ships like that St. Vincent. I mean, 17,000 damage there with a semi-armor piercing, that's good. And I keep thinking, you've got a broadside battlecruiser to be shooting at, you should be firing the armor piercing. And, and they are good armor piercing shells, but the semi-armor piercing is getting the job done. I don't think... I mean, they have just, of course, lost the Adriatico, and now they've just lost the Rune as well. So they're now down three kills, but with this final 18-inch semi-armor piercing salvo, boom, headshot, there it goes. I mean, they're still behind 100 points, but a couple of seconds ago they were behind 200 points. So on balance, um, this can be seen as a good thing. Both teams now control one cap circle. The Adriatico died trying to take on a Smolensk face first. Big surprise there. Um, but the enemy Montana was forced out of the cap circle at Charlie, so both teams control one cap. There's the defence, British... Oh, and he's got the armour piercing loaded for this one. I can't see this one ending well for this... Nope. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it may only have eight guns, but they're very, very big, and they've got cruiser dispersion. So, with 127,000 damage done so far, I think it's safe to say that this flank is largely secure now. There's just potentially the Kearsarge. Look, there he is. Lurking around there down to the south, although potentially there's a Preussen around there somewhere too. So, he's gone back to the semi-armor piercing. Let's see how much damage he can do with flat top. What's he looking at? He was probably looking to see whether or not he's going to run into the map border. Come on, let's have a look at the Keir Sarge. I want to see how much damage you do. Not bad. Not enough to sink him, of course, but I think his days are numbered because, well, Frostbite isn't the only one shooting at him. The Vermont's having a go at him, and that's got to be pretty scary because that thing's got a seriously large amount of seriously big guns, and there's a Republic just behind Frostbite who's unloading high explosive, and it was, in fact, the Republic who managed to get the kill. Uh, with a fire, of all things. <laughs> oh wait, hybrids don't get automatic damage control like actual aircraft carriers, do they? Yeah, that explains it. So, good news, bad news. They've managed to even the kills, the scores are almost even, but they still don't control any of the cap circles. And that's going to be a bit of a problem, especially when you see what these three battleships, the Vermont up ahead, Frostbite, and the Republic with him, do. The Kearsarge did have its aircraft airborne before it was uh, sunk, and naturally it's going for the Vermont because they're impossible to miss. They're big, fat, and slow. So a couple of fires there on the Vermont, although it looks like he's used his damage control since he's no longer in any immediate danger of having any fresh fires set. Notice how these three guys seem to be purposefully avoiding the cap circle at Alpha. Perhaps they think the Minotaur over there is going to take it. And honestly, based on that Minotaur's position, getting the hell out of there and sailing into the safety of Cap Circle Alpha might be a good idea. Extremely disappointing semi-armor piercing salvo against the Smolensk. But if you're sailing a battleship of any type in this game, getting extremely disappointing results against Smolensk is just a fact of life. Switches his fire to the Preussen instead, hoping for some bigger numbers. Shots out. Eight. 18-inch semi-armor piercing shells. And I think if he just... It looked like most of those actually hit the belt. And 114 millimeters of semi-armor piercing penetration is pretty good, but it's not enough to get through a German battleship belt. 
There's another exchange of kills. The friendly Asma just nailed the Frederick Schultz, a destroyer, but died in return to the Kremlin. So that's not a points neutral exchange. That's actually in favor of the enemy team. Cruisers are worth more than destroyers. So the more shots out again. He's trying to get that Preussen. And 17,000 is very good, but then, oh shit. Torpedo bombers from the Lexington. His anti-aircraft guns put on a brief light show for the amusement of the enemy torpedo bomber pilots, but hang on, where where are the torpedoes? He didn't just shoot them down, did he? No, no, he didn't. The Vermont and the Republique, who were right next to him, did. Manages to get some more shots out against the Smolensk, but with equally disappointing results as the first time he managed to get some shots out against the Smolensk. He might be able to clap the Preussen, though. Because this is not a slow battle cruiser. I mean, the whole point of battle cruisers is that they have the firepower to kill anything that can outrun them, and they have the speed to outrun anything that has the firepower to kill them. But with a base speed of 35 knots, and with the brisk skill active, which it is, and a speed flag running, this thing will actually top out at just a hair over 40 knots. And now we get to put the theory to the test that if you throw enough semi armor piercing at the Smolensk, eventually some of it's going to stick. And it does. I'm amazed that Minotaur is still alive, by the way. If you look at the position that he was in, and he's been doing a good job fighting off the enemy team and stopping them from pushing through from the central cap at Bravo. But the fact that he survived <laughs> is nothing short of miraculous. The team do actually now have a one kill advantage over the enemy team, and the Minotaur over there is hanging on there for dear life. He's actually inside the central cap circle at Bravo, and is the only reason the enemy team aren't getting any points from it. But he might have outstayed his welcome, because he's in a very, very thinly armoured cruiser. And that's a Kremlin coming around the corner. Frostbite sees it, he switches to the armour piercing. He's only got four shots though from the two front turrets. And it, it kind of looks like they landed a little short and actually hit the water and then went in and were absorbed by the torpedo damage protection. That's going to be really bad news for that Minotaur. The army up there to the north doesn't look like he's having a whole lot of fun either. Can he get some more shots off? Maybe? Possibly? Mm, no, not really. It's possible the Minotaur's torpedo... No, they're all hitting the island. And then the Lexington's dive bombers, you see that? Less than a thousand health. The Lexington's dive bombers very nearly finished the job that the Kremlin started. The Minotaur pops his smoke a day late and a dollar short, and no use whatsoever to frostbite because smoke firing penalties on 18 inch guns, the smoke screen may as well not be there for all the value you're going to get from it. But hopefully it'll keep the Minotaur alive enough to survive any return visits from the uh, enemy aircraft carrier. Frostbite charging forward, trying to chase down the Kremlin. And he's got shots into the Kremlin's stern, and even the semi armor piercing could penetrate that. The problem here, of course, is those guys over there. He is sailing into a crossfire, so he's got two options. He can either turn to the right to tank the shots from the Montana and angle against the Kremlin, or he can keep going and try to beat the Kremlin's turret rotation. He's not going to beat the rear turret, though, and this is going to hurt. And that did really, really hurt, because he's not a battleship, he's a battle cruiser. But this ship's damage repair party can heal back 33%, not just 10% of citadel damage. And now the Kremlin's trying to swing those front turrets around, and they are capable of finishing the job. He raises the sights, he's going for the superstructure, semi armor piercing, nails him. And there's the high caliber award, with 256,000 damage done, keeps going, here comes the Lexington. Fine, whatever. More importantly, he's out of line of fire of that enemy Montana. And it's huge array of 16-inch guns. Now, he did of course charge through that cap circle at full speed because he didn't want to get deleted by the Kremlin or cross-fired by the Montana, so he wasn't able to contest or flip the cap. But the Vermont is sailing in there behind him and doing that job himself. And even though the team have completely ignored the cap circle at Alpha this entire game, in fact sailing all the way around it rather than through it, the Republic is now flipping the cap circle at Alpha. So while they're still basically 300-ish points behind, they are now one kill ahead. Frostbite's got himself some nice crunchy on the outside, chewy on the inside cruisers to play with, and killing cruisers is what this thing's for. Enjoy the bitch-slapping Yoshino, plenty more where that one came from. 
The only significant fly in the ointment here is the enemy Montana. And if you have a look at the minimap, in fact, you know what, after he gets this shot out against the San Luis, I'll do even better than that. I'll take control of the camera and we can have a look for ourselves because the enemy Montana could sink the Vermont and retain control of that central cap. Let's take a look. There they are. Where? No, there they are. Honestly, this one could go either way. It kind of looks like they're doing a drive-by, and in a situation like that, victory goes to whichever captain can hold their nerve the longest and get the best perfect broadside shot off at point-blank range. Will it be the Montana? Will it be the Vermont? Oof. I think it's going to be the Vermont. I mean, they didn't nuke each other in the drive-by, but the Vermont has the assistance. Although he got the kill, he definitely had the assistance of the Minotaur. Another, I see a kind of disappointing hit against the San Luis. Note that the Yoshino is cowering behind the island, refusing to come out to the assistance of his teammate. His teammate who was fighting the kind of ship that was specifically designed to sink ships like the San Luis. More shots out. Let's see how this one does. 285,000 damage. Oof. <laughs> 301,000 damage. <laughs> Oh, and some shots out from the Vermont, who seals the deal and takes the kill. Well, all's fair in love and war, and it looks like the Yoshino has finally figured out where his W key is. Frostbite switches to the armor piercing, broadside cruiser, not quite point blank range, but as good as. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> Come on. The secondaries open up, but don't expect the secondaries in this thing to hit anything. Oh, that's some very, very nasty Yoshino torpedoes. I had a real bad feeling about this. Frostbite's got it all under control. <laughs> this is fine. <laughs> and the Vermont takes out the Yoshino as well. Couple of points to note here. There's only three minutes of this battle left, and while they only have to find and sink the enemy carrier, well, they first have to find and then sink the enemy carrier, and the enemy team still hold two of the cap circles. The Republic flipped the cap circle at Alpha, but in his rush to, well, let's be generous, let's not say in his rush to grab some cheap kills, let's say in his rush to assist his teammate here, the Vermont sailed right out of that central cap circle at Bravo. He's now reversing really, really slowly back into it, but there's less than three minutes of the battle remaining and they are a hundred points behind and it's going to take time to flip that central cap even with the assistance of the Minotaur who is heading into that central cap at Bravo in order to help out and that might not necessarily be time that they have with less than two and a half minutes of the battle remaining. I think they do actually have to find and kill the carrier or they're going to lose on points by the time the battle expires. Oops. To be completely fair to the Vermont, though, I mean, even if he had stayed in the cap circle and flipped it earlier, it would have still just been a one capture point lead, and that's only another three points every three seconds. So it, it, it may not have been enough. They might... Oh, Frostbite, look at your map. Frostbite, yoo-hoo. Look, yep, there it is. <laughs> There's the Lexington. So they may need to actually sink this Lexington anyway and of course now with that central cap at Bravo flipped anybody who's got the gun range and I guarantee the Vermont does is going to be looking for the kill but Frostbite got here first and saw him first he gets the first shots off wait for it <laughs> 31,000 damage <laughs> there's some shots there from the Vermont which narrowly missed because he's going for the Kraken Unleashed as well he's also on four kills Frostbite fires again shouldn't expect the same colossal damage numbers as in the first salvo because the the Lexington's going to be damage saturated and he doesn't quite kill him I guarantee you the Vermont is reloading but the Vermont has a 40 second reload and Frostbite does not and he's also further away so even if the shots are in the air these ones are going to get there first boom headshot Kraken unleashed 366,000 damage done. 
for Frostbite WTF in the Ruggiero di Luria, or however the hell the Italians pronounce it. Currently, this is the EU damage record in this ship. Although I don't expect that record to stand for a couple of reasons. First, this is still a relatively new ship, and also this was a standard battle. Somebody does as well as this in, for example, an arms race battle, where there's a lot more hit points around and ships regenerate their health. I expect that's probably where we're going to see somebody beat this record, but for now the record stands. 366,000 damage and more than 3,000 base experience, which is pretty good by anybody's standards. And I hope you've enjoyed watching it, because that's it for today. As always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.